All right. Thank you for joining us. Uh, 11 o'clock Singapore time and one o'clock Sydney time. My name is Daniel Bosco. For those of you who haven't joined us previously, um, so today we're covering injection waterproofing. It is a topic that we have covered um, previously, uh, but we were asked just to run it again, uh, just because it is, a, I guess, a topic of, of interest. So before we came to the end of this series, we thought we'd, um, we'd run through this one more time and it gives you an opportunity to ask some questions as we go as well, if you like. So hop on in. So getting started, uh, what is concrete injection? So it's a method of repairing concrete and rock defects. Uh, we can use resins and cement fluids and inject them into structures and we can fill those gaps and then seal against air or water. The types of products that we might inject include polyurethane resins, epoxies, acrylate gels, microfine cements, bentonite and silicates, just to name a few. So we use uh, these injection techniques in leaking slabs, uh, walls of underground structures, piles and permanent shoring, tunnels and basements, which we'll look at briefly, uh, bridges and car park techs and ground engineering, pretty much any type of structure really that the resin can get into. So over the years, uh, there have been a lot of advancements in the type of materials that we use. So I've been involved in this industry for getting close to 25 to 30 years now. And um, a few things have, have definitely changed and, and changed the way we operate. And one of the main things is the lower viscosity of resins available. So now it's not unusual to have a resin with a viscosity of less than 100 centipoise, whereas previously you were dealing with resins that were up around 500 to 1,000 centipoise. Makes them a lot easier to inject now. We have faster reaction times for water stopping, so it can quickly seal against that water that's in flowing into the structure. Uh, we can use single components. Going back a few decades, it, it felt like we we're always dealing with, you know, two and three and maybe even four component products to inject. It's just become a lot simpler now where we can use a single pack product and, and inject. And the chemicals have become a lot safer to use as well. So before we talk about injection and water sealing and the types of rectification methods, it's always good to have a look at um, the defects and why they've occurred. And that gives us a better understanding then of the type of method we should be using to, to do the rectification. So just looking at cracking, all concrete is designed to crack. I mean, that's the way you design it. It cracks and the steel takes the tensile loads. So we usually limit the crack width to 0.1 millimeter for water retaining structures. And typically there's a 0.3 millimeter limit for general structures. And there are standards all around the world which will cover those, um, those limits uh, for different circumstances and environments. Uh, the concrete uh, will usually remain alkaline and protect the steel up to those crack widths. Uh, crack widths below 0.1 typically aren't visible and cracks can be defined as either dead or live. So in other words, they're either moving and mobile and moving with loading on the structure or they're dead as in they occurred uh, at an earlier phase of the structure's life and they're no longer moving. So structural cracking, as you can see in the photo there, it occurs where tension is applied. Tension is occurring in the bottom part of that beam. So the cracking is propagating from the bottom. Typically it's even spaced and evenly patterned. Rarely does it go through the structure and this is the tensile member, but when you're talking about bending, this is the type of cracking that you see and it's variable width. So it's wider at the surface than it is at the uh, neutral axis or the center of the beam. So you can see why identifying this as structural cracking when you're looking from below would be important in terms of selecting your repair method um, compared to a crack which might go right through the structure. Drying shrinkage uh, cracks on the other hand, uh, they usually occur only within the first few weeks of casting. Moisture is lost uh, during the curing process and evaporation of the moisture out of it. The concrete shrinks. We've spoken about volumetric stability of concrete in other webinars. And the cracks just seem to be random in direction and spacing. They're usually through the entire cross section, evenly the whole way through, and will occur due to structural restraints. So as part of identifying uh, the type of cracking, the types of things we are going to look for is that pattern. So the randomness of the pattern, when it occurred, will give us an indication. And then from that, we can determine just by looking at the surface, how that crack width propagates through the structure. We also have plastic shrinkage cracking, which is typically just a surface phenomenon, phenomenon, just very shallow cracks, those ones. They occur because the evaporation rate exceeds the bleed in the concrete and usually because of poor placement techniques or overworking. So it's important to identify this type of cracking because an injection won't apply 
to this. They're just too shallow for, for injection methods. Plastic settlement cracking. These uh, occur over the top of the reinforcement. They appear within the first 24 hours of casting and it's usually caused by segregation. That's when the aggregate falls to the bottom of the section and it's separated from the cement paste over the top. That can occur because you're dropping the concrete from a height or because of over vibration uh, of the concrete. Thermal shrinkage cracking occurs due to the concrete cooling. So when concrete cures, it forms heat. It's an exothermic reaction. And then over the next few days, once it's set, it'll cool down. And as it cools, it shrinks again. So for every 10 degrees of cooling, we'll see about one millimeter per meter of concrete in shrinkage. It's quite substantial. When you, you think about concrete in a thick section, might re reach up to 80 or 90 degrees. It's quite a lot of shrinkage that will occur um, during the cooling process. They usually propagate through the section off the restraint. So you can see there in this photo that the wall has been cast on the slab and then the slab has restrained that wall from shrinkage. So we've got cracks propagating off the base of that wall. You can see they're evenly spaced and you would see that they would go right through the structure, even though they would narrow as you go up the wall. Crazing, uh, again, uh, it's a placement issue, occurs due to overworking of the concrete or working the concrete too late in its life, high wind across the surface, other curing defects can cause this type of crazy. Again, it's very shallow in nature, uh, looks terrible, really doesn't have much impact on the integrity and injection techniques aren't really going to be useful to you here. As you can see, this is the reason why we need to identify the types of cracks before we can work out what type of repair method is needed. I've just summarised those things here in a table. Uh, this table, will, as well with the presentation, will be available for downloading uh, later. You can request a copy of it. But this is not a bad little summary to have in your pocket when you're going out to look at cracks, uh, to look at the questions you might need to ask and the things you would look for to determine the type of cracking that's occurring. So why do we repair concrete? It's a question that doesn't often get asked. It's just assumed if you see a crack or you see a leak, we should repair it. But you know, you really do need to know why you're repairing that concrete before you select your final method. And that's not always clear. So there's basically three reasons why you would repair concrete. The first is for aesthetics. So it looks unsightly. Um, the contractor reputation is on the line. There's a poor perception by the users that maybe the quality of the structure isn't good. And there's also safety and slipping issues and other things that need to be rectified. So this is more about the aesthetics of the building rather than anything else. And usually a really good reason to repair concrete that may require different methods to if you were looking at corrosion protection, which is the second reason why you would um, repair concrete. So this is about durability of the reinforcement. We're sealing against water and oxygen replenishment. Uh, we wanna protect the surfaces and the fittings that are inside the building or the structure. So we don't want water dripping onto um, fire safety equipment and other things which might cause corrosion. We're also possibly trying to restore alkalinity in the concrete so it can do its job in protecting the reinforcing steel. And we wanna prevent contaminants such as chlorides and sulfates from entering the structure. So this is all about corrosion and protection. And this is the real engineering reason why we, we often want to go and repair concrete. The other one, which is a little bit uh, controversial is structural remediation. So this is where we wanna go and inject cracks or defects because we think that the structure might be weakened because of those defects. It's just important to recognize that when you uh, inject into an area uh, that is cracking, that cracked area is in tension or has been in tension at some stage. Injection is not going to increase the tensile performance of concrete. It may increase the compressive performance um, and it may increase some other features um, such as the um, ability for moisture and other things to penetrate. But structural injection is going to offer no increased tensile strength because even if you have really high bond on that resin that you're injecting into that tensile crack, the crack can occur adjacent to that again if it, if it wants to and, and tension is still applied. Um, and when you look at it, concrete typically is designed with zero tensile strength in mind anyway. So typically rebonding of the concrete is not effective, just an important thing to keep in mind. So just in summary, why we repair concrete again, just in a table, aesthetics, you know, it looks unsightly, um, user perception, safety, corrosion protection, ensuring the durability of the structure, and then structural remediation, trying to fill cracks that um, we fear may go into compression or may need some reason to be strengthened at some stage.
So crack repair materials that we use uh, vary and the selection of those will depend upon the amount of movement in the crack. So we know that structural cracks are going to be moving a lot. We know that dry and shrinkage cracks aren't going to be moving. So therefore we may select different resins depending on the type of crack we're trying to repair. The crack width will have an impact, the narrower the crack, the lower viscosity resin we're going to want to select. And then of course, the, the big question that not often get asked, gets asked is, the repair objective, you know, why are we repairing this structure? Is it for aesthetics, durability, or for structural reasons? Crack injection um, requires penetrability of a resin. So we need to select the right resin for the width of crack that we have and the type of injection that we're doing. Um, and there might be different reasons, different pen penetrability that we'll see from different resins, so different things. So just as one example of that, this microfine cements are often injected uh, for corrosion protection. So where you have honeycombing of concrete and you need to restore that cement paste, you might inject with a microfine cement and that'll maintain the alkalinity uh, of, the, of the concrete. Where you have a very narrow crack, you may be injecting a low viscosity polyurethane, for example. So hydrophilic resins, this is a term that you'll hear mentioned quite often. Uh, these will react with water to form a hydrophilic compound. And what we mean is that that cured compound will then react throughout its lifetime with water to expand and create pressure in the crack. So it relies on sealing the crack by expansion and, and sealing the water from getting through via compression. So it creates pressure in the joint to further enhance the seal. So hydrophilic resins are alive and active and they'll pressurise that seal. A hydrophobic resin on the other hand, it'll react once either with water or with its components and it'll form a completely stable compound which will maintain its physical shape even when in contact with water and it'll repel water. So hydrophobic resins resist water, they don't absorb moisture like the hydrophilic ones and hydrophobic resins uh, such as epoxy and polyurethane will bond well to concrete Polyurethanes will bond better to damp concrete. Uh, epoxies will bond really well to dry concrete and some dampness. So just summarizing again, the things we would look for. So we would look on the left-hand side there uh, to these questions of how wet is the crack that we're trying to seal? How much movement does it have? What is the width? And what are the pumps and expertise available? And then from that, we'll then select a, um, a resin based on the criteria that we've just listed out there. Just talking a little bit more about crack width. So very narrow cracks, as I said, 0.1 of a millimetre, you're not gonna see. You'll start, they'll start becoming visible at about 0.2, but generally these can't be injected. They're just too narrow. Um, and in most cases, the 0.2 millimetre wide crack is gonna be self-healing anyway. Uh, as we mentioned, 0.1 uh, is watertight. Uh, and below 0.2, you're gonna be pretty close to watertight as well and, and very difficult to inject a resin. Uh, at 0.2 to 0.7, you need a very low viscosity resin, probably less than 200 centipoise to be able to inject into that narrower gap. Uh, 0.7 to 1 millimetre, you can start looking at the higher viscosity resins. And 1 millimetre and greater, you will deliberately go and look for more viscous resins so that they actually sit in the crack better um, and don't flow all the way through. Just a little point about um, the penetration of a resin. Uh, it's often heard, and I've said it myself, that to get more penetration of a resin, you need a lower viscosity. Viscosity isn't the only thing that gives you penetration. And I thought I'd just quote the Navier-Stokes formula here, just to make a point on what is successful injection. And you can see there that there's a formula for flow being Q and the viscosity is on the bottom side of that, um, of that equation there. So in other words, if I halve my viscosity, I'm gonna double my flow volume. So there's a linear relationship there between viscosity and flow volume. When it comes to pressure though, it's pressure squared. So if I uh, double my pressure, I'm gonna have four times the um, injection capability. So that's gonna give me much more um, improvement than lowering the viscosity. On top of that crack width, which okay, we don't formally have much control over that, but for a wider crack, if it's twice as wide, you're gonna get eight times the amount of penetration. So it's just important just to have a feel for those ratios so that you know if you're not having success in injecting, getting to a low viscosity might help you to a certain extent, but then you're gonna to have to start looking at increasing your pressure to give you more penetration. Of course, limiting that pressure so that you're not damaging the structure in all cases. 
Crack repair methods and equipment, just briefly uh, touching on some of this. So water stopping is usually done by a PU resin with high foaming. Um, they're usually suitable for ground stabilization, very fast reaction with water. Don't be confused by the, the statement, very fast reaction. Uh, there are lots of resins out there that will react very fast. What you actually need is a product that forms stability and structure very fast. So not only should they start foaming quickly, but they should actually form a structure that will carry some load of resisting water very fast as well, not just foaming. Um, so that's a really important feature. Uh, crack sealing and injection resin properties, they should be flexible. Low foaming is good because we don't want lots of little um, air pockets and voids that can join together to allow um, leakage later. Uh, and we want the crack injection to be a long-term seal. So we're looking at more of a long-term uh, sealing solution, particularly in a dynamic environment with these in crack injection resins. So there is a bit of a difference between water stopping and crack injection, and you should get advice on which is the best type of resin to use for those two situations. One resin won't fix all your problems. That's probably the first thing to keep in mind. So injection methods uh, that we use, we can use gravity techniques in very wide cracks. We can just feed the resin from the top. We can do surface mounted uh, injection, as you can see in the example A there, where we've got surface packers epoxy to the um, concrete and we're going to inject through those. And then you have high pressure injection um, with packers uh, inserted as well. The types of injection packers, obviously the surface mounted, which we saw in the last slide, we have knock-in packers, which is that bottom gray one, they can just be tapped in uh, and create enough of the seal for low pressure injection. We also have mechanical screw-in uh, packers with either a clutch or a nipple head, which are those top two, and they're for more high pressure injection where we're trying to get into narrow cracks and we're increasing that pressure of resin for penetration. The types of injection equipment vary. Uh, the first photo there, low pressure injection, we can use hand cartridges. We can also use the gravity feed bottle just to squeegee that, um, that liquid in. Uh, it steps up then to small injection pumps, which are high pressure with low volume for very fine cracks. And then we move over across to the large injection pumps, which still have high pressure um, can have slightly higher volume, even though it says low volume, it's higher than the other types of hand pumps. And the, the volume starts moving up with the bigger the waterproofing problem we have effectively and the pumps get bigger in that regard. Just some of the, um, some of the little procedures, gravity filling, pretty self-explanatory. Uh, we V out the crack first. And as you can see in the photo there, we clean it out with air and water. And then we just flood the crack with the resin and keep filling it until that resin penetrates through. And there are some really good resins out there with extremely low viscosity that will penetrate really well uh, into cracks of around a millimetre or so. Again, the surface mounted packers, uh, we can use these for vertical or horizontal surface cracks. We V out the crack, we clean it with air and water, we surface mount those packers using an epoxy, and then we um, seal the length of that crack using an epoxy paste, and we use low viscosity injection to um, uh, resin to, to put into those packers and fill that entire crack. We then have pressure injection as well, which requires drilling at 45 degrees. Uh, we clean the holes. We um, typically are drilling about 100 millimetres away from that crack. At 200 mil uh, centres, we're drilling from both sides of the crack because we don't know if that crack is going vertical as it's shown in the photo there, or if it's at a 45 degree angle. A shear crack could be actually um, transmitting at 45 degrees and by drilling from one side, you may not actually hit that crack. So it's always important to drill a few holes first, install some packers and check that you're getting resin into that crack before you go ahead and drill. Um, the entire length of, of crack. So you just want to make sure that system is working. For wider cracks, we might epoxy paste the surface. Uh, typically, we like to, um, at, at a first point, leave that crack open so that you can actually see the resin coming out and you know that the resin is traveling. So that'll just depend on the circumstances as to whether we put that epoxy paste on the surface or not. So just a final note on uh, water stopping. So we use water stopping that's higher volume uh, injection. We're injecting behind the structure. We can use that on TDM segments, uh, gaskets, um, and, and in ports that are in the, um, in the segments as well. We can do this for pile walls, rock faces and cuttings, and any underground structure where we've got a large volume of water coming in. So we'll drill holes typically right behind that concrete. We'll inject resin and fill the void, react with all the water, trying to get close to the source of the water um, and cut that off with a fast 
um, setting resin. So as I mentioned, it requires higher volume and, um, and to resist the, the pressure of the water inflows, the fast setting resins, uh, we're injecting behind the structure at the, um, at the source, um, and we need bigger spacing of packers away from the inflows. And I'll just show you a little video here, um, just to give you an example of the type of pressure that you could be resisting. And as you can see, you know, just away from where he's installing that packer, there's a large amount of water coming in from the joint uh, between the two segments. And notice he's not inject, he's not drilling where that water is um, is coming in. Um, often you see the the first reaction is there's the water we should go and inject right there, but it's often best to move away from where that water is coming in, um, closer to where the source of the water is in the rock, and inject there and fill that entire void behind, and then you'll see that um, that seal up. Once he installed that packer in that particular case, there it was a job done recently. Uh, we started pumping, and within about 20 minutes, that leak had sealed up. Um, as you can see, injecting a high, um, a fast reacting polyurethane will give you a very quick um, response in terms of sealing if you know where to inject and you do the job well. So just in summary, uh, first of all, as I mentioned, you should establish the reasons for injection before you start. Is it aesthetic, corrosion protection or structural? The reason why you're injecting, you have to understand the type of crack and the cause of that crack before you dive in too deep without knowing that you might be drilling in the wrong place, you might select the wrong resins, um, you might just not be doing the right type of repair for that structure. And you should also select the right materials and method for the work. And we've given you some tools there to be able to ask the right questions in terms of selecting that right resin. So that's it on, um, on crack injection. Uh, thank you for, for sitting through that. If you have any questions on willing to, to answer. So I've just had a question to come through. Um, here, if we uh, complete injection, at the connection of a D wall and basement slab, do we need to inject along the D wall or at the joints of the D wall? Really, really good question actually. We've completed a lot of work in this area and the reason that you get uh, leakage in that area is because your D walls are cast in advance, maybe you know six months in advance of the base slab being um, cast. So then they excavate down and they cast this base slab. And that base slab can sometimes be quite a large span. So being a large span, it's going to shrink a lot um, back to the centre. And you could end up with quite wide gaps where the base slab meets the D wall. And typically from what we've seen, the type of waterproof and detailing that occurs there is usually pretty weak. So it allows for a lot of water to, to come in. Um, so therefore, this is a really common area for for water leakage if the waterproofing isn't done right. Uh, so there's a few ways of approaching this. Uh, you can drill and intersect right at where the slab meets the, um, the D wall. So the, the, the slab might be say half a metre thick and you might try and intersect halfway down. The way we like to approach it is two prong. First of all, we like to drill so that we're actually having the hole on the other side of the slab coming out um, underneath the slab. So if the wall is here, you want to aim so that you're drilling at 45 degrees and you want to be coming out of the bottom of the slab about 100 millimetres in from that wall. And you want to be injecting into the soil where those two meet just below. And what will happen is as the water is flowing into that joint, it will bring the polyurethane with it. The polyurethane will react and seal right at that intersection point and through. Then what that does is that gives you another opportunity to come back and inject with a, um, a hydrophilic resin actually into your joint. So then you can actually intersect at 45 degrees and, and inject with a hydrophilic resin. So you can actually, um, I think someone may have made that point for me. So it's a two-pass system. So yeah, I, I think actually well um, spotted in advance there of where I was going with that. So we start with the hydro, hydrophobic resin behind the crack. Uh, behind the joint and then we're going with the hydrophilic right into the joint and that's a two-pass PU system exactly as pointed out there um, by one of our participants so thank you for that I hope that um, that makes sense but I'm happy to answer that more directly if you want to shoot me an email and I can draw some little sketches um, for you to have a look at on how we approach that all right. Um, yeah, I guess that's it. Thank you very much for joining us today. Very much appreciated. Uh, tomorrow, I might even click the whiteboard on and um, we can draw up some of these solutions if, um, 
if some of the questions like this want to be asked. So please come back and, and ask questions on this topic or any other topic that we've covered so far over the last five weeks. Really appreciate it. And hopefully we do. We see you at um, nine o'clock tomorrow morning, Singapore time or 11 o'clock for the second session. Thank you for joining us today.